You know, one of the things that uh, we Americans value most is freedom. We cherish our right to be able to choose where we live, where we work, and our own destinies. We like the freedom of self-determination and self-expression. We do not like to be boxed in, limited in our options and our choices. We oppose those who oppose, who oppress and violate the rights of other people. We profess the value of justice and equality for all human beings as inalienable. Yet it seems that we have had trouble throughout our history defining who is a human being. On this Native American ministry Sunday, we focus on those whose ancestors were already living in this land for thousands of years before the European settlers came to these shores. Today, I want to tell you a story of the Nez Perce, and in particular, the story of one of their greatest chiefs, Chief Joseph. The Nez Perce lived in the area where the present states of Washington, Oregon, and Idaho meet. And ever since Lewis and Clark met them, the Nez Perce won the respect and even admiration of the whites who encountered them. They were a strong and hardy people who were friendly and peace-loving. In the early 1800s, white trappers and missionaries met the Nez Perce and befriended them. Many Nez Perce were converted to Christianity and adopted European names. One such person, who lived in the Wallala Valley, uh, converted and changed his name to Joseph. In 1832, this chief Joseph had a son whom he also named Joseph. Now, his Indian name was Thunder Rolling Down the Mountains. Over the years, both of them watched as more and more white settlers moved into their ancestral lands. The white people thought that the land was their own and hostilities became more and more frequent and intense. A treaty was finally signed in 1855, giving the Nez Perce 7.4 million acres of land. When white interlopers found gold in Indian territory a few years later, however, the treaty was ignored and white people poured into the reservation. And then instead of honoring the treaty of 1855, the government officials proposed placing the Nez Perce on a smaller tract of land. The Nez Perce who lived within the new boundary signed the new treaty, but two-thirds of the nation who would not would have to be moved voted against the treaty. For a number of years, the situation was unresolved. White settlers continued to take land, but the Nez Perce allowed them to do so without outright conflict. But sometimes the settlers would injure or kill a Nez Perce, and the Indians would then retaliate. In 1871, old Joseph died, and his son, young Joseph, became chief in the Wallala Valley. Soon thereafter, white settlers began invading the valley. For six difficult years, Chief Joseph struggled to keep the peace, but the white settlers became more and more aggressive. And although initially siding with the Nez Perce, eventually President Grant reluctantly bowed to political pressure and ordered all of the Nez Perce to be confined to the new reservation boundaries, uh, whether they had signed the treaty or not. Many of the Nez Perce called for war, but Chief Joseph convinced them that war would only lead to their destruction. So they made preparations to move to the new reservation. It seemed that war had been avoided as the people moved out of their ancestral lands, but a band of young Nez Perce bent on revenge for the killing of one of their fathers, raided white homes and killed over a dozen settlers. Tensions quickly erupted into outright war. Chief Joseph had urged for peace once again, but the consensus of the tribe was fixed on conflict. The United States Army was sent to subdue the Nez Perce and to force them to the new reservation, but Chief Joseph knew that hostilities would not end even if they went to the new reservation. He knew that his people needed to find their own home. And thus began the greatest retreat in American history. 1,200 miles as the Nez Perce searched for a new home while being pursued by the army. The Nez Perce were fierce warriors and used tactics which surprised the white military. They outright won or fended off a force four times their number 
in four battles and several skirmishes. They fought at Whitebird Canyon, Clearwater Creek, Big Hole, and Camas Meadows. They outmaneuvered and outpaced a seasoned army, even though they also had to bring along their homes, their families, and their herds. Because of the brilliance and success of the Nez Perce, Chief Joseph was later called the Red Napoleon uh, by the American press. But in reality, Joseph was more a Lincoln than a Napoleon. And although Joseph did fight outright in two of the battles, he was primarily in charge of protecting the women, the children, the old men, and the herds. Throughout his life, Chief Joseph was more of a diplomat and ambassador than a warrior. He was a man of great dignity and wisdom far beyond his years, with a deep compassion and abiding concern for his people. After the Battle of Camas Meadows, it became clear to Joseph that they were no longer safe in the United States and that they would have to go to Canada to be free. The Nez Perce crossed into Yellowstone Park, headed for Canada, but they decided to stop for a rest at the Bear Paw Mountains just 30 miles from the border. They felt that they were safe with the army of General Howard, who had been doggedly following them, was at least two days behind them. They did not realize that anyone else was pursuing them and that white people used a telegraph. An army under the command of Colonel Nelson Miles caught up with them from the east at Bear Paw, and a four-day battle was fought. Several of the major chiefs were killed in the battle, leaving Joseph as the undisputed chief of the Nez Perce. Joseph knew it was all over when Colonel Miles uh, was able to capture a majority of the herd of the Appaloosa horses. Without uh, their prized horses, he knew that they couldn't go on. On October 5th, Chief Joseph surrenders in one of the most famous speeches in American history. And this is part of what he said. Tell General Howard I know his heart. What he told me before I have in my heart. I am tired of fighting. Our chiefs are all killed. The old men are all dead. It is cold and we have no blankets. The little children are freezing to death. My people, some of them, have run away to the hills and they have no blankets, no food. No one knows where they are perhaps freezing to death. I want to look for my children and see how many I can find. Maybe I shall find them among the dead. Hear me, my chiefs. I am tired. My heart is sick and sad. And from where the sun now stands, I will fight no more forever. Then his purse had lost their land, their horses, and their freedom. Colonel Miles uh, had promised to take them back to the new reservation, but his superiors ordered the Nez Perce to be taken to Leavenworth. There they were put in a swamp area where many died of malaria. And then they were sent to the oppressive heat and dust of Oklahoma. And although Joseph eventually lived out his final years in Washington State in the Colville Reservation, he never again saw his beloved Wallawa Valley where his parents are buried. Joseph, however, did become a powerful spokesperson for justice for Native Americans, especially his own people, the Nez Perce. But even as well-respected as he was, few took any action to help him. His biggest advocates were a colonel, now General Miles, and an aide to General Howard, Lieutenant Erskine Wood. Erskine Wood befriends Joseph. And Wood's teenage son even spends a summer with Chief Joseph and his adopted son. Later, before Joseph dies, young Erskine Wood asks Joseph what he would like for his birthday. Joseph replies, give me a horse. Well, Wood's confused because Joseph already has many horses. And yet, even as close as Wood was to Joseph, he did not understand that to a Nez Perce, a horse meant freedom. When Joseph was asking for a horse, he was asking for his freedom. Chief Joseph dies on September 21st, 1904 in the Colville Reservation. The doctor said 
he died from a broken heart. Chief Joseph was a great leader, diplomat, protector, warrior, peacemaker, and spokesperson for justice. He was not only one of the greatest Native Americans who ever lived, he is one of the greatest Americans who ever lived. He was an advocate for the most precious of American values, freedom and justice. So why do I tell you this story? To remind ourselves of those American values. I tell it because the story of the Nez Perce and Chief Joseph is our story. It is part of our American heritage and our history. And our American heritage and history is not just of what happened to the white people in this land. Our heritage and history cannot be told just from a white European perspective. We must own the history of all American people. Our history is the story of, yes, European settlers, but also of native populations who were abused, mistreated, and displaced. Our history is the story of being oppressed slaves and being oppressive slave owners. Our history is the story of Chinese and Irish and Russian, Indian, German, and Mexican immigrants. Our story must be told from their perspective too. We are all looking for dignity, respect, and the chance for a better life, and the freedom to be who we are. So in one way or another, we are all asking for a horse called freedom. Amen.